Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES for 10% off any purchase over $10. However, from now through January 2nd to celebrate the new year, instead of 10% off your purchase over $10, you will get 15% off. Additionally, if you use the promo code between now and January 28th, you will automatically be entered into a drawing to win a booster box of Ravnica Allegiance. See the description below for details. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and today is the first day of official Ravnica Allegiance previews, and as we always do, we're going to recap all the cards that were revealed today, do a little bit of light analysis on each one as well. And as you can see here, we got a lot to talk about. Quickly before we get started though, just a fast reminder, if you check out the description below, you'll find a few ways to support the channel. Our Patreon page is down there. You're also going to find links to products on Amazon. If you make any purchases on Amazon, once you go through that first link, we'll get a small percentage. Finally, Flipside Gaming still offering a promo code for our viewers, and today is the last day that promo code will give you 15% off as opposed to the regular 10% off. So do remember that, but as always, thank you not only to the folks that look at those links, but to each and every one of you. Y'all make the channel what it is, but let's get into today's information. For each card we're going to look at today, I will put the source in the description below, so if you're curious which content creators got which cards, you'll find all that information down there. Now let's look at our first card. All right, brace yourself. Mass Manipulation. Four blue XX Sorcery Rare. Gain control of X target creatures and or planeswalkers. Okay, so this is a little too expensive and situational for standard, so we'll just move on from there. Limited. A lot of limited decks are going to have a hard time playing this. Drafter Sealed. And you know, in this particular format, we saw this in Gills of Ravnica, many times you end up playing three color decks. Four blue could be real tough to swing. Now, if your deck can swing it, maybe you do play it. At times, this might just be a six casting cost control magic for you. And you know what? That might be good enough in limited draft or seals. You might be happy to play that. But just know your deck. If you don't think you're going to be able to consistently cast this, then don't touch it. Commander is where you want to play this card. That's really what this card feels like it's built for. In Commander, you might have a situation where you have a lot of mana available. If that's the case, you're going to be able to grab a whole bunch of really cool things off the battlefield and just take control of them. So other than Commander, I don't know if this is a very good card, but it could be a lot of fun there. Sphinx of Foresight. This costs two blue and two. It's a rare 4-4 creature type Sphinx. You may reveal this card from your opening hand. If you do, scry three at the beginning of your first upkeep. Flying at the beginning of your upkeep, scry one. Okay, this is a pretty packed card for four mana. That's what I like to see. So where does this C play? Probably in standard. I could see this showing up in some control builds. Forecasting costs 4-4 four, four with flying with these abilities. Feels pretty solid to me. At the beginning of your upkeep, scry one. That's great. But that first ability, being able to potentially smooth out your early draws in the game if you have this in your opening hand, that's kind of awesome. Outside of standard, I do think this is perhaps a windmill slam out of a lot of draft packs. It's monocolor. It's a very powerful monocolor rare in a set that has a lot of powerful gold cards. So when you see this, you might be really happy to just grab this and try to stick with blue as one of your colors, where sometimes the gold cards, even if they are powerful, are a little riskier as an early pick. With that being said, I think this card is really sweet. Love the design here. Our next card comes to us from a Russian language preview. We've got the translation here on the left, Biomancer's Pet. It's going to cost a green, a blue. It's a mutant. This one's a 2-2 rare. Activated abilities of creatures under your control cost two less. This effect cannot reduce the cost to less than one mana. Tap until end of turn. The next time target creature adapts, it adapts as if it had no plus one plus one counters on it. Okay, let's talk about standard first, then we'll talk a little limited and some other things. So with standard, I do think this has some potential. It depends on how good adapt is, I think, though. If adapt turns out to be really pushed in this set, then yeah, there might be some deck that is trying to use adapt. I kind of wish this was a merfolk and not a mutant, but if adapts good enough, it might not matter. It could still potentially see some standard play. It only costs two for a 2-2. Two, two. In limited, this is a very solid rare. If you're already going down the adapt path, or maybe you just have some other activated abilities on creatures that are going to cost you mana, that this will give you a reduction, you're going to be happy if this shows up in pack two or pack three, definitely. Do I first pick this? Maybe some of the time. It depends on what else is in the pack, obviously. I might not pick this over an uncommon removal spell some of the time because this is setting you down a very specific path. But if there's nothing better, I wouldn't be sad to see this. I would just try to push adapt if I could. I think this is most interesting, though, maybe in Commander, just because it's a budget version of Training Grounds. And yeah, it's obviously a little different. This is a creature, not an enchantment. But if you have a Commander deck that plays that card, then here's a cheaper version or else a redundancy for you. 
Another rare here, Deputy of Detention. It's a blue, white, and one, Vidalcan Wizard 1 3. When the centers the battlefield, exile target non land permanent and opponent controls and all other non land permanents that player controls with the same name as that permanent until this leaves the battlefield. That's a mouthful, but basically it's a creature version of Detention Sphere, is what it is. Detention Sphere was a great card in its day in standard. Still sees playing modern. Now, will this replace it in modern? I don't think so. I think Detention Sphere is going to be a little stronger in that environment. Where I could imagine it at some point in Modern, though, would be as part of a Jeskai Wizard deck. I guess we'll have to see if that pans out. Maybe it's good that it's not a human. That would really have pushed the human's deck in Modern. However, in Standard, this definitely will see play out of control builds. Maybe we'll even see a new variety of control decks coming out of the meta, but even the ones that currently exist, I think, would be really happy to use this card. Standard Wizard decks might get a push from this as well, and in Limited, this will be a great card for you. This is one of those gold cards I'd feel comfortable first picking in a draft just because the power level is so good here. It's basically a removal spell that gives you a little bit of board presence. Next we have a Planeswalker. It's Dovin Grand Arbiter. Three loyalty, blue, white, and one. This is a mythic rare, of course, legendary Planeswalker Dovin, plus one. Until end of turn, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, put a loyalty counter on Dovin. Okay. Minus one. Create a 1-1 one, one colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying. You gain one life. Minus seven. Look at the top ten cards of your library. Put three of them into your hands and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Okay, first I want to say that this is a very unique Planeswalker. Considering it's in Azorius colors that cares about creatures, that's very unusual. Like a Boros Planeswalker or a Rakdos Planeswalker, maybe. But this feels strange, but not strange in a bad way. Okay, maybe I'm not going to throw this in my typical Azorius control build in standard or anything like that, but I do think this opens up a lot of play space and lets you think outside the box when it comes to these colors, and I do like that a lot. One of the big upsides that this card has is the fact that it only costs 3 mana. 3 loyalty for 3 mana, quickly going up to at least 4, is pretty good. I like the economy there. Now let's look at these pieces. The plus 1. Okay, this is going to just basically try to fuel the minus 7, and that's the whole point of the plus 1 for the most part. And that's okay as long as you have creatures. The downside here is if you don't have a lot of creatures out or evasive creatures, then this might not be doing a whole lot for you right away. So that's where this is going to be maybe a little strange at times in standard, but I still think it will be standard playable in the right build. The type of decks I'm thinking are maybe like Bant Tokens or perhaps a Esper deck using these new Afterlife mechanics from Orzhov. That could be kind of interesting. We'll have to see if there's enough pieces in the set to make that happen. Now, the minus one does a couple things. It helps protect Dovin, which I like that a lot. It gives you a creature with flying that might be able to hopefully garner you some loyalty later if everything works out. It also gains you a little life, which is going to be helpful against those aggro builds. Now for the ultimate. I usually don't like to judge a Planeswalker by the ultimate, but this one's a little bit different. It's not a big ultimate moment trying to end the game. It's more or less a way to help you keep pulling ahead fueled by the plus one. So it works in a different way than most Planeswalkers. And the minus seven is good. I mean, it's like a really strong version of dig through time. And we know how good dig through time is. If you can get there and make it happen, you're going to see a lot of your deck and pull the best three cards out of it. So overall, I really like this card a lot. Not only do I think it will see standard play, like I mentioned, but this is first pickable in a draft pack limited. This card is going to be bananas. I mean, let's face it. Anytime you're going to be playing limited and you find an opportunity to play a Planeswalker, you're going to be happy. And even if it's a gold card, don't let that stop you from first picking in a draft because you can always splash one of the other two colors if things don't work out. But regardless, it's going to be really good in the creature-centric limited formats. And even beyond that, Commander, maybe in some kind of Bant token deck or something like that, it could be real strong there too. Hydroid Crisis, another mythic here. A blue, a green X, and this one is a creature jellyfish Hydra Beast. All right, zero, zero. When you cast this spell, you gain half X life and draw half X cards, round down each time, flying trample, and then it will get plus one, plus one counters based on the X you paid. I was mentioning earlier that I do think we might see perhaps some different kinds of control decks come up in the future. Maybe bat control will be more of a thing with a card like this. Who knows? This feels like a really nice control finisher, as long as you have the mana to pour into it. Or perhaps with the rest of the Shocklands coming, we might see a four color control build doesn't have flash or anything but it does give you potentially a large flying trample creature i do like that a lot and it also will gain you some life again good against the more aggressive builds which have been strong in the past and you also draw a few cards potentially look at it this way you don't have to have a huge play with this card if i put six mana into this thing i'm going to go ahead and get a four four flying trample creature i'm going to gain two life and draw two cards yeah that feels super economical so I do think it's the standard play. Aside from that, and Limited, another card that I'd be happy to first pick, even though it is a gold card. 
simply. Again, I can splash for the other color. Hopefully you're in green though, because green might be able to push your mana a little bit, but if you're not, it's not a deal breaker by any means. Commander, there's moments you might have a lot of extra mana to play with. This could be a real big play. Judith the Scourge Diva. All right, I'm already sold on this card. It costs a red, a black, and one. It's a legendary creature, human shaman, rare, 2-2. Two, two. Other creatures you control get plus one, plus out. Whenever a non-token creature you control dies, this will deal one damage to any target. So keep that in mind, it is any target, that's kind of nice, but non-token creature you control dies, activates it. So if your opponent's stuff dies, it doesn't matter. If a token you have dies, it doesn't matter. Keep that in mind. So that's maybe kind of sad if you were hoping for an aristocrat-style strategy in Mardu or something like that. Well, this card's not going to be a part of it anyway, but hopefully we'll get some other cards, we'll see. But where this does work in Standard is if there's a Rakdos or Mardu aggro deck at some point. In that type of build, I think it helps keep the pressure on. It's a 2-2 for 3, which doesn't feel amazing out of the gate. But as long as you have a creature or two in play, which hopefully you do on turn 3 when you play this in that style of deck, then it does feel more economical because of that power boost that those other creatures are getting. They can keep putting on the pressure by attacking, and when they do die in combat, this will deal an additional damage. So that's kind of nice, and it just keeps the pressure on. I like this maybe more in Mardu because I could put some afterlife creatures in there potentially. And even though this doesn't interact with that afterlife token, the creature dies, I do a point of damage, now I get a 1-1 flyer. It just keeps the pressure on. So I do think there's a possibility at least that something like that will happen in standard. In limited, I think this will be a fine card as well. Maybe not always first pickable because you are committing to a more aggressive plan if you play this. But you know, if you're playing draft or seal, typically you're going to have a lot of creatures anyway. They're going to die as you play the game. You'll find value here. Most of the time, if you're in these colors or a combination of these colors, you will play it. Next, we have another Planeswalker. It is Kaya Orzov Usurper. This is going to cost a black, a white, and one. Legendary Planeswalker Kaya Mythic 3 Loyalty plus one. Exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard. You gain two life if at least one creature card was exiled this way. Minus one. Exile target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. Minus five. This will deal damage to target player equal to the number of cards that player owns in exile and you gain that much life. Okay, so we have another three casting cost Planeswalker with three loyalty, very similar to Dovin in that regard. Also has some very unique design qualities to it, which is cool. Is it as good as Dovin? No, not as good, but I do think this still sees standard play out of sideboards because you're able to use this against things like Llanowar Elves, Jumpstart spells that are in graveyards, which have been very good in these Is It Drake or Is It Phoenix decks in the past season. So I do think there's a home for this. There's definitely a place for it. Outside of standard, does it do anything there? Modern, Vintage, Legacy? Well, yeah, you know, it does target a lot of strategies that you're going to find in those formats. I mean, look at Modern right now. Dredge is very popular, doing really well. This does kind of hose Dredge. This also hoses a lot of key cards, anything from Aether Vial to Nova High Arc. The list goes on and on. The problem is the three casting costs for this. I feel like there's more efficient ways to hose those cards currently in the format. So I don't know if you need this. If you happen to be in these colors, though, I would say at least test it out, see how it plays out of the sideboard. But I do think you might have better options, honestly. In limited for me, this is still a good card. I would still probably first pick it in a draft pack. It is a Planeswalker. How bad could it be, right? The minus five is what you're trying to do here, which is unusual. Most Planeswalkers, you're not too concerned with the ultimate. Typically, if you get there, wonderful. You're probably already winning. But with this card, the way it's designed, you're just trying to work towards that minus five. And even if your opponent doesn't have any one casting cost spells that matter, that are out there that you can exile, or they don't even have any graveyard interactions, Getting to that minus five is going to give you hopefully a nice little point swing. If you do that even one time during the course of a game, I think it's worth the three mana you paid for this. And that's wonderful, right? So good enough. Not anything that's going to blow the doors off the limited game even, but it's still going to give you maybe an advantage to pull ahead. And there's nothing wrong with that when it comes to a card that's not using a lot of resources. And remember, at the end of the day, if you're up against an aggressive build and you're getting beat down early and for some reason your opponent doesn't have creatures in their graveyard, you can target your graveyard and still gain life, so that's an option, don't forget that. So, yeah, you know what? A card like this isn't super exciting, I'll be honest with you, but i rather have a Planeswalker that I play in Standard out of sideboards than a Planeswalker that I don't play in Standard at all. So, I do think it will have a home, and I'm fine with it. Alright, the next group of cards I wanted to look at were the Lockets. Now, we kind of knew they were coming, but they've been confirmed, we gotta look at them. And if you remember these from Guilds of Ravnica, basically the same idea here. Each of these will come in for three mana. They're artifacts, commons. They'll tap for one of the two colors, and then you can pay four hybrid mana of those two colors, tap and sack to draw two cards. Now, in the previous meta, these five lockets didn't necessarily make a big impact on standard or anything, and I don't expect these to, but in limited, sometimes these were helpful. 
I didn't use them all the time, but especially if I was trying to splash one of the two colors or needed a little extra ramp, I would consider using these in my drafter sealed builds. However, considering Simic, colors especially seem to want to push mana a little bit this time. In those cases, the ones that give you blue or green might even be a little better than normal, we'll have to see. Now this is the Azorius Locket, of course. Here's the Gruul Locket. Orzhov Locket. Rakdos Locket. Simic Locket. We also got to look at the Guild Gates, and just like in Guilds of Ravnica, each of these will have two pieces of art. They'll come into play tapped. They're all commons. As a matter of fact, I assume they'll be taking the land space again, and of course they will tap for two different colors. In this case, we have the Azorius Guild Gate. What's cool about these cards, too, is they did actually see a little standard play. Sometimes you just need like one or two more cards that are going to give you two different kinds of mana, and these will work. I don't know if you're going to see that as much this time around because you're now getting the other five shock lands to help smooth the mana. You might not need to do this anymore, but they're an option if you need them. They are good and limited, though. They slow you down, but they do smooth your mana and, again, help you splash sometimes. Here's Gruul Guildgate. Orzhov Guildgate. Rakdos Guildgate. Simic Guildgate. I love what they did again with having like the main entrance of the guilds that you see on the left are and then like the back door of the guilds on the right version of the card. And yep, they showed us the shock lands too. These are all reprints as well as the guild gates were, but these are rare. And of course they smooth your mana and are more consistent because you have the option to have the card not come into play tapped, but you pay two life if you choose to do that. Now the art might already be familiar to you because Wizards has been showing the art in various places. We just haven't seen the cards yet. But of course, here's Blood Crypt, Breeding Pool, Godless Shrine, Hollowed Fountain, and Stomping Ground. And you know what these cards do. I mean, these see modern play. They're just very solid ways to fix your mana. They will, of course, see standard play. They're good and limited as well to help you smooth things out. Don't overlook these cards or the Guild Gates for that matter when you're drafting. All right, with that being said... That's what we got for today. Now, we're going to be back tomorrow with a recap of all the cards that come out over the next 24 hours. But until then, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon and have a great day.